For freshly brewed discussion on automotive sales and marketing, this is Coffee with Jason. The Coffee with Jason podcast is sponsored by Closer's Coffee. For that full-bodied, rich, sweet flavor with a bright acidity. Drink Closer's Coffee, stay caffeinated, and keep on closing. Find out more at closerscoffee.ca. Hey, um, hey, thanks for Anderson. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. And, uh, you know, for, for everyone who doesn't know who you are, Herb, can you give us, you know, a couple minutes of how you got into the industry, you know, where it all started for you and how you ended up where you are today? Yeah, sure. So I've been uh, involved with the automotive industry in some capacity for a little bit over uh, 18 years now. Um, I started actually on the fixed operation side of things as a loop tech and a tire technician, moved up uh, to be a writer and a service manager. And then I had the opportunity to have my own business. And then I went and uh, worked for one of the bigger names in the automotive industry today, which is Cox Automotive. Um, and I worked under the uh, auto trader, Kelly Blue Book umbrella, if you will. And nice. yeah, I really learned a lot there just about the industry. It really, it really allowed me to become an, uh, a student of the industry. We had access to so much uh, data, so much information. And then um, I had an opportunity to do what I'm doing right now, which is working with uh, GSM as a uh, account executive. It's a little a of both, right? So we have the, the digital marketing side of things and the fixed operations background. So it kind of meshes together. Um, and it's been a lot of fun to kind of put both of those pieces and uh, be able to kind of help, uh, you know, service managers and, and general managers come up with some strategies to really help with their retention and their service market share. That's awesome. That's awesome. So now, did you always have a passion for cars or is that something you just kind of grew into? Like how, how did the automotive portion kind of kick in? Yeah, it's been in the family, you know, from Michigan. Um, my, my grandfather worked at Ford Motor Company. My dad worked there. So um, it was just kind of, you know, just a part of uh, our DNA, if you will. So I've been involved in it, you know, since I was it's a little. It's literally in your blood. That's what yeah, it's, for it's, sure. It's, yeah. it's not going to come out. Yeah, I remember, uh, I remember working on cars with my dad and he was like very meticulous and, and you know, um, doing that, you know, we did the whole changes and we did all that, that, you know, bonding father, son thing. So, yeah, well, uh, you know, one of the reasons I was really excited and, and it, you know, I, I find that as car guys, we all kind of have some similar stories, you know, and, and how we kind of got into the business and what drives us. And I feel like once it's in our blood, it's something we can just never get it out. It's just always kind of there, right? And then we kind of find our place as we go along, you know, within the industry of where we end up, right? Um, yeah. So speaking of the industry, so that's one of the topics, you know, one of the, what we wanted to get into today was, you know, look, the industry is different this year. You know, we've hit a plateau. You know, we've had several years of growth, you know, consistent growth year over year over year. And now we've hit a year where, you know, manufacturers are looking at very flat numbers or very minor, you know, increases. Or in some dealerships, some manufacturers actually were looking at increases within their units sold. So I think a lot of people right now are questioning, you know, are the strategies that I'm utilizing right now really going to work? I mean, everybody's getting tighter in what they're doing. Um, you know, there's a lot more ad dollars getting spent in there because there are a lot more people going after that in-market customer. Um, in your part of, of the country, what are some of the strategies you guys are currently working on you're seeing some success with? Yeah, so um, just kind of to echo that really quick before I get into a specific, right? Um, I agree that there's, that there's kind of this, this tension in the marketplace right now. But at the same time, I mean, we've been um, enjoying, you know, steady growth. Right. So it's no surprise. I mean, industries, you know, have their ups and downs. Right. I think that right now we're in a, in a very good position for upside for those, um, uh, you know, managers, dealers, um, principals that um, capitalize on the opportunity. Because a lot of people are kind of putting the brakes on things because what's the first thing we do? Right. We cut, cut expenses. Um, so um, there's really a lot of opportunity in the marketplace. For, but it has to be. Um, you know, you got to look at what's working. We got to look at the, the things that are active and kind of double down on those things because a lot of people are pulling back. Right? So if you kind of know what's really, um, you know, moving your numbers right now and you double down on those things, you're going to get a lot better uh, results as, as other, as your competitors kind of pull out of the market. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what strategy for me, something that I've been seeing that's been working a lot um, is omni-channel solutions focused on the customer's database, right? Talking to those customers that in some way, shape, or form had said yes to us in the past or continue to say yes to us every single month, 
by um, servicing their vehicle at the store, right? There's tons of mm-hmm. opportunities. And what I like, I mean, if you look at it from a sales perspective or front of the house perspective, what I really like about um, kind of focusing on our customer base on our DMS is that those are true opportunities, right? Those are true opportunities to generate business. Because when you think about it, those customers are not in the market, right? They're not shopping with us, but they're also not shopping with our competitors. So if we can convert sure. customers to a sale, now we're not taking market share away. We're actually creating it, right? And I think that, that there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of missed opportunities when it comes to kind of, uh, you know, just mining your, your service activity, for example. No, you know, I, I think you're right. A lot of dealerships, um, if they haven't started mining their data, they definitely need to start mining their data. Um, there's so much opportunity in what these customers do. But I, I think when we start mining the data, because a lot of people go, well, how do we start mining the data? Yeah, there's tools out there that we use to mine our data. But I think the first place you got to start is kind of identifying these people into multiple buckets, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you're going to have clients that are very good at servicing with you. You know, it, they don't need much of any efforts. They, they will consistently always kind of come in. You know, they will do their oil change before you even contact them to be mine to do their oil change. Right. They're just what I call it an A-class customer, right? Then you kind of have this B group, you know, which will come in, but they'll come in more casually and they need to be a little more prompted to to come in. And then you got those C, those C customers, those customers that maybe only come in for warranty, very seldomly actually do the regular maintenance with, right? Um, what I have seen is that when we start div- uh, dividing out into buckets, then the messaging that we give to them is at the individual level can actually vary and we actually see a better performance off that. So I think it's kind of that first level of dividing and mining your data is first taking a look at how good of a customer they are in the first place. No, I yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. But look, I mean, think about this, for example. Like I was, I had a conversation with a GM a couple months back and I actually put a piece of content on this on LinkedIn. But we were talking about, you know, strategies. He's like, yeah, I, I mean, like you said, there's all these tools out there. Um, you know, what, what can we do with all these customers that are coming in? And one, one thought for me was like, why are you not using your advisor to set this up? Think about it. I mean, advisor has a better relationship with that customer than the person that sold them the car, right? Because the person that sold them the car talks to them twice a year when it's their birthday or their vehicle anniversary. Maybe they'll send a personalized, personalized letter. Or they'll give them a call or send a text message or something like that. The advisor is talking to this customer all the time. They know the name of the kids. They know the name of their pet. They know, they know all the things that this person likes. So why not bring those, those folks into uh, the mining process and have them talk to the customer and obviously, you know, set up some sort of reward system for the advisor so that there's an incentive or a pull for them to actually, you know, want to do that. Right. Um, I mean, I think opportunities are there. It's just, we just got to change the perspective a little bit and kind of realize, you know, the value that we have uh, in that relationship, right? Between the advisor and the customer. It's not just service-based. It could definitely work for you uh, when it comes to generating new sales as well. So would you go as far as kind of creating a profile then for what this person looks like? I mean, if I was working with the advisor, you know, kind of at that, that process level, and I'd say, all right, you know, Jack, Okay, if this customer comes in and they have A, B, C, and D, all right, these guys really kind of fall into our profile. So do, do you go as far yeah, as your personal yeah. profile? Okay. Definitely, yeah. You know, obviously, you know, set it up by models, things that, you know, cars that you need, things of that nature. That's right, if it's got 60,000 miles or more, they purchased it for three years, maybe the lease is about to expire, you know, I don't know, six months or something like that. You know, so yeah, definitely, that, that creates create some some you know some some gu- a guide if you will that that they can look at when the, when they identify those those prospects and obviously you know have to start that conversation the other thing about that strategy too that i find um is effective it's not it's not a it's a, um it's more of a soft touch if you will right so the customer is well you know it's like hey listen mr customer you know i just want to let you know that we're looking for your vehicle um you know, there's some good opportunities right now. Would you, you know, would you be interested or something, you know, or if you have some equity information, maybe just pass that as you're giving them the, their receipt for that service visit and just leave it. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, I think, I think definitely having some sort of profile or something like that is, is the way to go for sure. Now, have you find, I have found you've had the opportunity to be in a lot of dealerships. So I've been an opportunity to, help to be in a lot of dealerships and, and, I think these are great processes and great strategies. 
where I see it sometimes they fall apart is in the team effort. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day because I was talking to a friend. And you know what? We are investing into our brick and mortar businesses. We're into the experience. And, you know, I see a lot of people are really utilizing technologies and different tools and widgets to enhance what that experience is. We're investing into that online experience. We're, and we're even going as far as investing into our staff and their development and their coaching. But then I don't see a lot of dealerships investing time in developing out their team and how the team actually works together. I've been in so many meetings where I've had you know, the parts manager on one side, the service manager on the other, the new car manager, the used car manager, the collision manager. And, and if I wasn't there, I feel like they may actually be physically in a battle with each other, or in some cases throwing crap at each other. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, so it's like, you know, it's, it's like the service manager hates the used car manager, you know, because, you know, he's a cheap bastard. And then the used car <laughs> manager hates the service manager because he's always trying to gouge him. You know, and then the new car manager is not happy with the parts manager because the parts manager wants to gouge him on the parts. It's like, it, it's like, it, 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 I know it's something simple, but if we're trying to execute a strategy on this, well, we're actually going to try to um, mine our data and we're going to do that through process, then we got to get these people working as a freaking team first. I mean, oh, it, yeah. you've been in a lot of dealerships. Have you, is, any examples that come off the top of your head where you see someone really executed on the team effort? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, yes, there's, there's a lot of examples, but, you know, the, the thing is that it feels like, individual islands sometimes, right? Like we're nobody. I actually had a conversation about this on, on one of my um, episodes on, on my podcast, but it feels like nobody comes over until there's like smoke and fire. Right. And that's when we're willing to step in. But, um, you know, the, the, and they come over with a cup, they come over with a cup of, a cup of water, not a hose. Right. right? Yeah, exactly. They're, just coming, they're, they're, they're coming over to watch it burn. That's what yeah, they here, do. Here's my part. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but, um, you know, the ones that are, that there is cohesiveness and they're working together kind of in tandem, if you will, um, you can feel it, right? It's just a different experience from the moment that you walk in, right? And you're having the conversation where it's not just you talking to the service manager or the GM, but it's you, the GM, the service manager, the parts manager is involved in the conversation as well. And we're creating these strategies that are holistic, right? Uh, Cause that's another thing. A lot of times we set up these strategies and, the service manager or the parts, the the fixed ops director was like, yeah, great, let's do it. But the GM has no idea or the sales manager has no idea. And then it's like, you know, what? There's confusion, right? We don't know why we did this or why we're doing it. Now, I'm just trying to think, you know, um, that's funny, you know, I'm thinking about it. You know, I work with a lot of dealerships. I've spent a lot of time in dealerships and I, I can't think of a whole lot off the top of my head that are intentional about creating that team environment. Do you know what I mean? I find yeah. sometimes the team environment comes organically because, you know, uh, the service manager, the parts manager, they play hockey with each other or something like that. And, you know, it's just like there was like some other type of relationship that it kind of creates some tightness. But I don't know a lot of dealerships that are being intentional about making sure that all of those teams, those islands, like you say, are actually yeah. showing with each other. Yeah. Yeah, no, I have a few stores that, that where I see that and it's, it's really, it's really awesome to see. Right. I mean, you can definitely, there's, there, there's a difference for sure. For sure. Um, well, th- those are the ones that can actually execute on strategies like this, right? Yeah. Well think about this, right? So at a micro level, right. We like to talk, well, this word experience has become kind of a buzz, right. In the automotive industry, everybody's talking about all oh, the, it's the experience. It's the experience. But what are we doing that's really an experience for the customer? Seriously, yeah. like, what are we doing? You know, like there's nothing that we can point out and be like, oh my God, that's an experience. You know, we talk about it, no real examples. There's no real, um, at a micro level in a store, there's nothing really that you, as a consumer, even you were, you were, you're there and you're like, wow, okay, this is, this is different. Yet, it is probably one of the easiest things to do today because nobody's doing it, right? So if you tweak your, your process just a little bit, like if you did it just a little bit different, it would be different, right? It would stand out. Um, like for example, uh, I have a store that it, it's, in, it's a single point in a remote location out in Denver, uh, in Fort Collins, small town. And they have this thing where they put this uh, recipe of the week on their Facebook feed, right? Mm-hmm. 
and it's tons of activity. And the, the, when I talk to the GM and I talk to the, the, the salesman, like, dude, that's probably one of our most successful things. It has nothing to do with, with automotive, but the sure. people consume that information all the time and they feel kind of obliged to that dealer. So when that opportunity comes to buy or service their vehicle, they feel indebted and they're, they're willing to go there and they bring it up like, Oh, I tried that recipe. It was awesome. Um, you know, thanks for posting this and things of that nature it generates activity and it's different. It's unique. You know what I mean? So I think that that's where, you know, we know what we need to do sort of thing, but we're just not executing at a micro level. Well, I think you're right. I mean, when it comes to creating an experience, it, a lot of that is driven through our process, right? But, but I, I feel that I feel that we don't end up developing an experience because we don't actually know what the hell the goal objective is in the first place. It's like we almost bypass that part. You know, like let's, for example, I, I've been in a lot of a lot of meetings where uh, they discuss a very similar process to what you just talked about. You know, as far as getting the service advisor involved. And, you know, getting them to at least start talking about it, maybe introducing the used car manager and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and they'll build out this process. First thing, they won't normally write it down. I don't ever get that part at all. Like, they'll just, let's right. talk about it. We'll have a good meeting. Well, maybe we'll even put it on the whiteboard, you know, but then we'll walk right outside the door and pretty much forget about 75% of what we actually said we were going to do. Um, <laughs> but but, but we, well, we don't have a defined, like, actual measurable goal and objective in mind. Right, so it's like it, it, I feel like if we're going to take that strategy of getting that um, advisor to actually uh, communicate or maybe set up the intro to the used car manager or something along that lines, then, then we got to have a goal behind that. A goal objective may be okay. Well, let's say we want a thirty percent penetration, you know, or a twenty percent penetration, twenty percent. So you know, we're talking about two out of every ten customers need to be turned over to the used car manager. Right. So it, yeah. then, okay, fine. Now we actually have a targeted goal in place and we can continue to move forward as far as, you know, how the process goes. But again, if we don't write it down, how the hell are we going to execute on something we don't actually know? You know, it was like in the, in the boardroom, this sounded like a badass idea. This was going to bring us a bunch of money, you know, and then we walked outside and it was like, it didn't actually go anywhere. So, you know, I, and I feel like the experience is the byproduct of us developing out these goals and objectives and then documenting what these processes are going to be and then actually and executing on it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And here's the other thing too. Like we don't have to, like a lot of times, you know, you know, when you bring this up, right? Like, Hey, the, 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 the way of setting it up, it's always, I always feel like a lot of the reservation is in the, the, of it all right well yeah. i do it but i don't have all the writers here or i want to do it but i need more this first no i mean let's do it let's set it up like you said let's put that plan in motion and let's tweak it as we go along right but let's take the action as well let's go ahead and create that strategy set that process uh, set up some boundaries and accountability measures right so we can make sure that we're, we're tracking yeah. Uh, you know, how it's progressing and how effective it is or what needs to be changed and altered to get the desired result. But let's take the action too. It's never going to be perfect, right? It's never going to be the right time. We just need to do it. We need to execute on it as well. I think that's a great point. Also, if we don't, when we have to document the process, but if we don't have some way to measure the effectiveness of the process, then we, look, the, the first time we do it is not, is not, the first time we do it won't look the same as the 10th time we do it. You know, we have to be able to kind of change it and move it around. I actually yeah. remember hearing a dealership um, up north of me. Um, they print out their work orders, okay, on just like a manila type, you know, piece of paper, kind of harder car cardstock kind of paper, right? Except when they want to flag a customer, they print it on blue. So when, when they see a blue one, the customer is sitting in the service department and they're holding a blue one, it's literally an indication to the entire service department that somebody needs to chat with this guy or gal. Oh, wow. Like, I, yeah. thought that was kind of, I don't know. I kind of thought that was badass, actually. I'm like, that's actually really damn smart, right? I'm like, that, that's smart, you know? Because like, it's like it, it, you did no words were said. There wasn't like, let me take you over and, and you know, in, engage with you. It's like, the service department have their process, all right? They have their, their profile of four or five things. If someone falls into these four or five things, then you print out a blue right. work order, 
blue blue document, not the Manila one. And the customers walking around or sitting at a, sitting at a, one of the lounge spaces, and they have the blue one in their hand. All right, it's literally to tell the entire department that hey, this guy or gal, someone needs to talk. Right? Yeah, um, wow, that's pretty. Okay. But but again, it's only as good as how well we can actually execute it, and then how well we're actually right. going to be able to measure, you know, measure the the, the performance of it. And, and I feel like with dealer principals and general managers, you know, they get so caught up in the actual activity of the strategy that they don't actually spend enough time to monitor and measure the performance of the strategy. So they never get to a space where they can actually say this worked. Have you seen that? Have you seen that? Oh, yeah. Too? yeah, for sure. There's definitely a disconnect there. And I, um, you know, for example, it comes to mind is I was talking to somebody recently and we were talking about accountability, right? And one of the things that we mentioned was, you know, we're spending, we're seeing a lot of dealers investing in sales training, which is great, right? And, we, you know, I think that that's one of the areas that we need a lot of help in in the industry. So it's, I love to see that we're, we're being more proactive. But then we send our staff to, do, to go do this training, but the managers don't go. And the staff come uh, yeah. to the dealership and they got all this awesome training and nobody and the managers can't follow because they didn't go. So they don't even know what they talked about, what was covered, what the, you know what I mean? So it's like, mm -hmm. how can you hold them accountable, right? If you don't, you didn't even go to the training, you don't even know what, what the objectives were, what was discussed. So, you know, there's definitely a disconnect there. Same thing on the marketing side of things, right? Like I said earlier, we create these strategies in place. We talk to different people. It could be maybe a GSM or it could be the fixed ops director. We create the strategy. Awesome. But then the, the decision maker, the, the GM doesn't know what's happening. And so how can he like measure it? How can he see the effectiveness of it if, he, if he's not aware of the strategy itself, right? So sure. for sure, some, some disconnects there, definitely. Well, and that's also, you know, we're talking about divisions and islands, right? I mean, marketing yeah. and sales seem to literally live on entirely different islands. And, and in some cases, that's because the marketing it may be may being handled at the group level. It could be being handled internally or it could be handled by, by a vendor, you know, and it, it doesn't necessarily. I find that in a lot of cases when it comes to our marketing and the strength of our strategies, it's simply because of who we chose to actually work with, right? I mean, look, there's, there, there's creative, there's execution, and there's strategy. And sometimes you can't get all three from the same people, you know, but you need all three. Right. You know, without strategy, then you're just doing creative for the sake of doing creative. You know, you're executing on it, but it's just, it's just out there. There's no strategy. It's, it's not actually bringing in ROI, right? You know, if you have the strategy, but no ability to execute on it, then it's, right. it's, it's useless, right? Um, so I, I, I think what it is is dealerships have to look at it from a three prong approach on, on the marketing side that they need to have all three of these things and they first need to go in and identify who's responsible for all three of those pieces, right? Who's responsible for the strategy? Who's responsible for the execution and who's responsible for the creative? You know, I totally, I totally agree with you, but I also think that maybe a lot of that has to do with the short term mentality, right? I think that that's a, that's a big a big thing. And I think we need to, you know, one of the things that we need to get better at in the automotive industry is looking at it from a long-term perspective, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. strategies, and I'm sure you've had the conversation where you put something in place, 30 days are up and they're like, Oh, it didn't work. I didn't get anything from it. It's like, yeah, I mean, you gotta, you gotta let it run its course, right? You gotta let things um, kind of do what they're supposed to do. There, there's a little bit of, you know, it's not just a 30 day turn and, and that's what you're going to see. You know what I mean? And I think that a lot of that has to do with the way that we look at the business itself. Like everything is on a 30 day cycle. Yeah. So, um, you know, it just makes it harder um, when you're trying to make change and you're expect you have an expectation of it's changing now and change is a process. It takes, you know, it's a journey. Yeah, the 30 day process really has been hurting our industry for an incredibly long time. I, I've seen it get a little better. You know, for the longest time, I was a very angry individual against uh, manufacturers. 
actually had <laughs> one manifest to reach out to me and they go, hey, Jason, we, we actually don't do our stuff anymore in a 30-day cycle. We're looking on a quarterly basis. We give the dealerships the opportunity to hit those numbers on a quarterly basis. And I'm like, okay, maybe I should, maybe <laughs> it's maybe things have changed for some, so for some manufacturers. But, but at the dealerships, I still think we're stuck on really focusing on that 30 days. And how many times as a manager was I told I was only as good as my last month? Right. You know, it's like, it's like literally I was, or even a salesperson, the same thing, right? I was, I was always fighting to maintain my space in that 30 day cycle. And if I dropped all that 130 days, it didn't matter that I had six months of amazing performance. It all came down to what that 30 days, what that 30 day cycle is. And, and the same thing, you're right. It has, it affects our strategies and our marketing and goals objectives. You know, I'm a, I'm a big whiskey and scotch fan. And uh, I'll tell you, grain scotch or whiskey out there, I can drink in 30 days. It would create, it tastes pretty horrible, right? Um, you know, I was actually talking to my friend today over a whiskey. You know, I'm like, you realize that this took seven years to make, seven years, all right, to get this color and flavor profile. So, like, you know, we had to put all this energy into something and we had to let it mature. Now, I'm not saying as an industry we should let seven years go. That's not what I'm saying either, but <laughs> let's just give let's just give things or due time, right? But I, do you think it's the 30 days? I think a portion of the 30 days, but do you also think that maybe it's because there wasn't actually a real proper uh, written goals and objectives for each one of these strategies? that we're just so quick to give up. Cause we do have this mentality of like keeping up with the Joneses and just always changing shit so damn fast in our industry. Well, I think a lot of the, uh, well, let me speak from the marketing side, right? Because that's what I, what I know. Right. So I, mm -hmm. I'll tell you a lot of it has to do um, with us, right? It's the way that we're setting it up. Right. I think that we have this fear of what, during presentations of, you know, really setting out the correct expectation for the decision makers because, you know, we're, we're, we're fearing cancellations or we're fearing that we're not going to get the deal, whatever, whatever the case may be. But, um, you know, I think that we, that we need to become a lot more effective at, um, you know, kind of setting up the right expectations so that the customers know or the clients know what that return is going to look like and when is it going to, when is it going to, you know, when is the good time to really measure the effectiveness of whatever strategy? Uh, so let me give you an example. I, um, you know, I was talking to, to or I said something with, with, uh, with a decision maker recently, right? And, and I, you know, my, I told him the expectation is we are going to start to see increases in 30 days, right? We're going to see them in 30 days, but we're not going to see the outcome in 30 days. It's going to take, it's a 90 day, it's going to be a 90 day cycle before we get there. And sure enough, um, you know, 30 day mark came, no conversation, 60 day mark came, no conversation. Right. But it was set up in advance, right? Like, Hey, this is what, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to expect to see. And this is what the outcome is going to be. The other side of that is we get, we we're very quick to take credit, right? When things are going good, but we're very quick to be like, oh no, it's your fault when things are going bad, right? Oh no, you're sure, not, of course. or you're not using the, the tool properly. It's not me, it's you, Mr. Dealer. You know what I mean? So if you, do, if you don't have those discovery conversations and you don't set it up right, and then you go and take credit for things when things are awesome, then you also have to take credit when things are not awesome, right? And be like, hey, you know, you, it's, it's, it's got to go both ways. So no, you're 100% right. In fact, actually, I think that's a really important thing to bring up because it doesn't really matter if you're going to work with a vendor like one of us, or if you're going to do it internally, or you have to work at the group level. If there's not an expectation or a a goal for what everybody has to do, that it's so easy to fall back and just start playing the blame game. You know, yeah. it's like it's like as as a marketer, I'm willing to take responsibility for this, this, and this. All right. As a dealer, all right, in that in dealership experience, I need you to take responsibility for this, this, and this. Okay. Now there are going to be times, and that way everyone's held responsible. But if you're right. If we don't have that that discussion, if that's not documented right out of the gate, then it's no surprise that these relationships are such a revolving door type relationship and dealerships are moving from one widget to the next widget from one vendor to another vendor. They're just constantly trying to find things. I think it's a really good point. This industry, we're not doing enough of that, right? 
you know, really trying to identify who's responsible for what. And then during our reviews, making sure that everybody actually did their part. Right. And sometimes, you know, not to get off topic, but it's just it's something that kind of, it's a thought that comes to my mind, but it's something that you actually said on a, on a podcast that I heard you on recently, but it's okay for us to tell the customer like, Hey, you don't need to spend any more money. Right. You don't need to do this. So that's not the solution here. Right. Because you already have all this activity. Let's get good at this here at, at maximizing this before we add more to it. Right. On the fixed off side of things, I can tell you that I've seen stores that I consult with that I go in and I do my first discovery meeting and we start looking at stuff and it's actually costing the dealer money to get customers in. It's actually costing them. So you're paying money to lose money. It doesn't make sense. Right. So, um, you know, I think that, the, the you know, I, I hate putting things on the dealer all the time because I think that they get a lot of that. We got to step back a little bit ourselves and, and kind of really, um, you know, like I said, take accountability on that and make sure that we are setting things up properly. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't typically talk too much about my business. I really try to keep the content more relevant, but I mean, you know what we are, I'm actually completely comfortable with taking responsibility for a dealership's floor traffic. Um, and, I, and I do, I'm like, as long as you document it, you know, I can go out there and create the most amazing marketing strategies and creative and content in the world. But I understand that sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate to actually people walking through the door. You know, I just didn't target the right audience, even though online digitally, hey, the analytics said this was a home run, but if they didn't actually make that next step, then it, maybe it's not a home run and I'm going to have to rework what my strategy is, right? But I, I think we do need to take a look at who's responsible for what. I'm willing to take responsibility for that. Now, once I get into the door, it's the dealership's responsibility. Um, that way you tell me, if it, well, we had someone off cars. I'm like, well, uh, <laughs> uh, the traffic was there, bud. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's for another vendor to, to, to work with you on. But, but you're right. I, I think, does it not just feel like we're falling into this placement and we're just kind of doing things for the sake of doing things. And we're not really developing our strategies for them, but we just do them because everybody else is doing them. Yeah. I think there's a lot of that. I think, you know, uh, we, we go, we go, we get on these kicks or these trends of things that, you know, are, are new in the industry, you know, and, and kind of shine. I think that we, we kind of fall victim to that as well. Um, and another thing is, you know, I don't think that a lot on the, on the, side of things we're not doing a lot of learning right we're not doing a lot of uh, of becoming students rather of our industry mm-hmm. right um as a consultant we should be able to walk into a dealership and have intelligent conversations about the business as a whole at a micro level at that store right um because i can't really help a dealership if i don't understand the business if i don't understand their market unless i'm selling a specific widget and this is all i do and I, you know hey mr dealer this is what i do this is my my vertical my silo here that costs you know 250 a month there and then you know we shake hands and i'll send you a report every month great but if you're a consultant you got to become a student of the industry you have to be able because you can't help if you don't understand the problem period i mean there's just no way right and the thing about decision makers at yeah. the level is that they're busy man when I was a manager, I was, that's a, that's a, that's a very intense job. You're not just managing people. You're, you're a controller, you're a trainer, you're a tech, you're all these different things, right? So you uh, have, to, you have to be able to, um, you know, see the things that they're missing, right? Cause there's a lot of stuff that they can't even see themselves because they're in it every day. Right. So I don't know. I think that, a lot of value that you can bring if you become a student of the industry, if you become a student of that particular business, and you can really help them move the needle and come up with strategies and things that are actually going to impact the business. And I think impacting the business is, is really key. And, and what it sounds like, um, and I like this, this is a really good topic, and maybe we should open this up, make sure there's some vendors also listening to this as well, is, is stop, rent, stop being a rep, right? And start yes. being a consultant. I you know, that. like I, I think the, uh, God, we have enough reps out there, don't we? Like, yes. you know, it's just like their, their, their knowledge of the industry pretty much stops where their product is. That's exactly. it. Yeah. You know, it, I, I would agree with you. I would say it, as an industry, and I'm giving vendors now a hard time, is, is that we're not providing enough value uh, to the dealerships. 
And, and, and it, our, our value should not just stop at the products or services that we provide. If you're consultant, that's not where it is. You know, right. uh, it's funny, I actually probably end up, it's ironic, I don't know, it's just going to work out this way, it's just, I guess because I was a dealer principal at one point, you know, is that I end up spending more time probably talking about operations than I do actually talk about marketing. <laughs> right <laughs> my business is marketing. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's that's where the value is. I, I agree. I, I think if we can help dealerships, we need to bring more value to the dealership. That's what that's the bottom line, right? And and uh, I think that this is a call to all vendors out there that we need to start bringing more value to them. And I, I agree with you what you said. We do that through being that consultant. So walk me a little bit more through that. What does that look like to you? You walk into the dealership and you're not a rep. You're a consultant. How does that? How does that look to you? So you got to touch everything, right? You got to talk to the salespeople. You got to talk to the GSM, the advisors, and the and the service manager. You have to have a relationship with with pretty much everybody at some place in that dealership, so that you can have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Because you know, sometimes you'll like, for example, I have a dealership um, in Salt Lake that's been it's we getting really good conversions on the stuff that we've implemented, but their KPIs are not where they need to be, right? And through discovery mm -hmm. with an advisor, we found the problem, right? The fixed operations director didn't know it was that that was the issue, right? The general manager didn't know that that was the issue, but that advisor was involved in, in a process change that that dealership implemented. And when I had the conversation with him, I was like, oh, yeah, I know what it is now because, you know, this change happened and this would definitely affect that. Right. But if I would stay just having the conversation with the manager, like, Hey, my numbers are good. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, you know, then that would, if we would have never been able to, to really help that dealer. We would have never been able to help them take that, get to that next level, figure out the issue and fix it. So you have, and that's really creates a partnership, right? I mean, oh yeah, for sure. And, 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 you know, obviously the dealers are static with that and they they really see the value in it. And, um, you know, it just, it's a way to do, go beyond, right? You always want to give more than you're getting back. I mean, that's a, that's the leverage, the kind of leverage that you want to have. hundred percent, hundred percent. No, I, I, um, you know, it's actually funny is I was just recently in a, a meeting with a new customer and uh, about 15 minutes into it, the guy had to stop and was, wait a second, wait a second, are, 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 am I interviewing you or are you interviewing me? I, I wasn't necessarily hundred percent sure. Um, and, and I said, look, I said, I said, I got to know your business. I need to know the ins and outs of it, right? I mean, I need to know, you know, I, I'm, I'm very much an open, I have dealerships, I have some great relationships. So, so don't really give, show me their profit loss statements. And, you know, running through those numbers, you know, I can start to identify or see where opportunities are. But it's taking on that, I've gotten to that position where they feel comfortable doing that because they're taking that consultant role to it. So much so now, and, and vendors listen to this, um, this is where their value or my, the perceived value that they have in doing business with us goes beyond than the product or service that we actually offer. Yeah. And, and that's a win-win for everyone, right? For sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, and you know what? When you look at, you know, what, like what we start, what we opened the show with, we were talking about the, you know, just the downside in the market, right? Having that insight and really being there to consult can really help create strategies that are going to help in these times. Because this is when the dealers need the most help, right? Is when things are not up, right? That's when they need outside yeah. That's when they need a different perspective. Um, and if you're, if you're not, you know, if you're not reading, if you're not, up, you know, if you're not listening to podcasts, if you're not educating yourself, if you don't understand the business at the micro, it's going to be really hard for you to add, be able to add that value. Then you just become, then you truly are a rep and you're just, you know, selling your one widget and that's cool. That's all that you're there to do. But um, if you're going to be a consultant, then it's, requires a lot much more than, than just your products and solutions, whatever it is that you offer. Well, and I, and I see the more time the dealerships spend at the strategy development level. All right. The easier it is to choose which widget they work with or which company that they work with. Right. It's just, it seems like we, I hate to say it, but dealerships and I, maybe I've said this before, we're always kind of looking for that quick diet pill. You know what I mean? 
It's, yeah. it's that quick fix, the thing that's going to just fix our problems and it's just going to go away. I, it, look, times are changing, okay? Things are going to get a little tighter. I mean, we need to start spending more time in developing out our strategies, one. And like you kind of said earlier, I think another big value is developing out your team. Because I don't think we're doing enough of that. I think we're, we're, we're training and coaching our, our, our salespeople in activities, but we're not developing the team at that, at that management level. Yeah, I know. And I think that that's where the, that, that's a little bit of a, and this is a new, new perspective for me because I've spent some time with some people that have opened my eyes to this. But I think the training has to, has to when we're talking about training, the management is the one that needs the training. And then the, the management should train the staff. I mean, I think that that's, that's really the most effective way to do it. Because if the managers are trained and they have a, a set process or something like that, then they can teach the, the people below them hold them accountable because they understand what the goal is. They understand what the, what, you know, what, what their objectives are. And as turnover occurs and new people come in or get promoted or whatever the case may be, then they still have that knowledge base that they can pass down. Right. If you just train, like I said earlier, if you train the staff, but the management doesn't know, then the staff's there and there's just, it doesn't work, you know, and then those people leave yeah. and get all this time and money and training these folks that left and are taking all that value somewhere else. And it's just, you're just not getting what you're, what you need to. Um, so I think the management really, that's where a shift needs to occur and we need to train them so that they can train everybody else in the store. I, I agree. I, I, we have to work with the managers and start training the managers, but here, here's the way I, I kind of look at training because there, there's a lot of different levels, right? There, right. There, there's training, all right, and that's it, it's more of a training on the activity. So what activity do you do, right? That that can, and then there's development. You know, that's developing out activities that have kind of better performance, meaning you get higher test track ratios, or higher closing ratios, right? But then there's just kind of this third element that I don't feel like we do enough at the manager level, and that's coaching. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I've met some wonderful sales managers in the past, and I tell you the thing that I find that makes them really, really successful in what they do is how amazing of a coach they are, uh, almost to the point where I would consider them even a cheerleader. You know, like, we can train the staff, all right, what activities they can do. We can develop out those activities so that the performance are, yeah, are, are better, but then we got, we got to coach them. Like we need yes. to be some cheerleaders in there, man. We got to be supporting these people. It's not enough that we just show them the ABCs on how to sell a car, right? And, you know, and then tell them how to continue to better those ABCs. Like we got to, we got to be in there. We got to, we got to coach, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm, I agree. A, I'm a huge Lombardi fan. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I am, but if you read some of his stuff, that guy was an amazing coach. You know? No, yeah, totally agree. So um, I spent some time with Sean Kelly, the Carbis coach, and one of my biggest takeaways from him was, um, you know, shout out to Sean. Um, you know, he told me that, you know, the difference between training and coaching is that training is for skill, right? That's where you develop skill. Coaching is when you get better as a person right? You get, you go from to that next level, you become a better version of yourself through that coaching, through that coaching. So skill is only going to get you so far, but coaching is really what's going to help you progress. I totally agree with that. I agree with your point, right? We do have to have a lot more of that. Um, you know, I think it just goes to one of my pet peeves in the industry too. Like, why are we still, you know, like from a, at a salesperson level, why are we looked at as, the, you know, plaid jacket sales, you know, like that whole perception, it's just it's gotta stop, man. You know, you don't, don't go through that, you know, and they're selling, you know, we're selling the, the second most expensive thing that people, that most people are going to buy in their life, right? The cars today are a lot more advanced or more, you know, you have to be really prepared to talk product. Right. Um, so I totally agree, man. I think that we, that, that that's got to change. Sure. It, it's perception. It, it's it's the yeah. consumer's perception, the, the the who we are, who we are as individuals, and just how we are. So, but that's where also like, um, you know, I, I just recently did a podcast with Del Patron. Shout out Del Patron. Um, but he set up a humble job of supporting himself and his team to show people out there that they're just people too. You right. Know, they they got quirks and they got passions and they got hobbies and and yeah, they sell cars. 
but they're not robots. You know, right. they're just yeah. normal individuals, normal individuals as well. But you know, I actually I think this is a great you know spot to. Right. I, I know we can we can continue to jam on this like all day long, but I, I mean I think we had three you know possibly four real key takeaways here that dealer principals and upper management should really take a look at in in 2019. I'll highlight those and then give get your thoughts on them as well. You know, it is one really take the time to develop up strategies in in your marketing in your operations. These strategies have you have to take time to build them. You got to document these strategies and, and really work through them and measure their effectiveness so the strategy is actually working well. Uh, secondly, some team development. I think some team development is going to be really key moving into this year. Is that we can't lose any opportunity, like any opportunity as well. So we can't lose a customer just because the used car manager doesn't like the service manager. The service manager doesn't like the used car. The used car manager. All right. We can't lose something because of that relationship. So we right. need that upper management team to really act like a team and look at every single customer as being their customers collectively together. Not, well, he's a, he's a new car customer. No, no, he's a service customer. It's the same customer. We've got to treat them as a team, yeah. right? And, 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 then, and then third, we got to start coaching our staff. You know, we, we need to be the cheerleaders. We've shown them how to do. We've shown them what to do. We've given them opportunities um, to develop out their skills. Now we, we need to coach these people and coach them really well. Um, and then uh, was, there, was, there, was there anything you would want to elaborate on those three things? Yeah, well, not so much elaborate. I agree with all the points. What I would say is uh, the, a fourth takeaway for me is, um, you know, let's really, let's stop talking about the experience and let's actually create it, right? Um, let's, yeah. Definitely do that because I, I agree that the experience is what's going to get us more customers and it's going to make us different, but we need to do it. We can't just talk about it. Be like, Oh, that's what we need to do. We got to create an experience. Yeah, we do. So let's do that. Um, let's figure out what that for us in our particular market and our particular within our particular brands. And let's definitely focus on creating and delivering an actual experience to the consumers. That's awesome. I think that's that kind of rounds up kind of our, our takeaways from this talk. It's it's like you guys gotta go out and execute. <laughs> yeah. It, it, the better we are at executing, all right, the faster we'll fail, the better we'll get at it. All right. But this year, this is your year of execution. So no more talking. Go out and like you said, just do it. Right? Just do it. Uh, Herb, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I, I really, really appreciate that. Um, for the people out there that would love to connect with you and find out a little bit more about what you guys are doing, where's the best, best place for them to connect with you? Um, LinkedIn, uh, definitely. Uh, you can reach me there. Um, uh, also, you can send me an email at uh, handerson at gsmarketing.com or you can give me a call on my cell phone, um, 713-501-6082. I love to help just have a conversation. You know, If you just want an idea or something, feel free to hit me up. I'd love to um, support you in any way that I can. You know, I love it when people on the podcast will drop their phone numbers because it really shows that they're willing to just really kind of put their, you know, their money where their mouth is and say, no, man, just give me a call. Let's get this thing going. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I'm going to put awesome. you on the spot now, though, and I'm going to ask you to come on okay. my show. So are you going to come on the, the Dealer Talk podcast? Well, well tell, tell everybody out there, what's the Dealer Talk podcast? So we can get some more audience going there. You know I'm going to be here. So, yeah, tell yeah. us a little bit about the Dealer Talk. Yeah, so Dealer Talk is, uh, you know, it's uh, it's um a podcast, right? Designed for the automotive industry. Uh, the goal of the podcast is to add value to people that are in the business doing it day in and day out, right? So I try to have people that are working in the dealership or vendors that are consulting with dealerships uh, to just talk about tips and strategies and things that they can do to kind of get an edge. So um, really a, a selfish product for me or project, excuse me, because I learn a ton through it and obviously I consult with dealerships. So all that knowledge, you know, I take with me uh, and that's one of the reasons why I put it out there. But yeah, I mean, if you're looking for another resource out there, just check it out. Awesome. Awesome guys. And, and dealer talk that's on YouTube, right? Yeah. So, so we yeah, it's on YouTube, YouTube on all uh, podcast platforms. Um, so wherever you get your podcast fix, you'll find us there. Okay, awesome. All right, guys, you heard it. Uh, check out Dealer Talk. I will be a guest on Dealer Talk here very shortly, so we'll be able to jam again. And Herb, thank you so much for your cool. time today, dude. That was, that was a blast doing that.